Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1. There's a lot of amazing things that we can pull from 1 Corinthians 1. Number one, Corinth was a messed up church. Now, when I say that, you think, aren't all churches messed up? Yes. But this one's on paper. We can actually see it. In fact, I would say maybe in some of us, it incites us to want to judge about how not as messed up we are as they are, right? That makes us always feel better. But what's amazing is, is that Paul's method of correction for every church is still the same. And it's a good one. It's absent of guilt, and it's full of grace. Paul does not come out with guns blazing, he comes out with grace blazing. And he wants the believer to understand one thing before he brings in the idea of correction. You are deeply loved, you are deeply privileged, you are deeply blessed, and you are irrevocably saved, despite what goes on in your life. A lot of people have difficulty with that. Some sins are just too great for us to understand. Surely they can't be saved or God would let someone go after such atrocity. I tell you what, let's not underestimate the grace of God and the extent of which he offers it. One thing it always helps me to remember is that all of our sins were future when Christ died. And he knows it all. He saw it all. None of it scared him. None of it surprised him. He never looked over at the Holy Spirit and said, can you believe they did that? Even though that's often how we react when we hear about believers who are wayward. So let's start in verse 1. We're going to read through a couple of comments here and there, and then we'll pick up in verse 17 where we left off. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And who is that? Anybody remember? Us, me, you. I hope you know this. That's you. If you don't know that's you, you need to know that's you. Because you're going to want to know that that's you at some point. We are sanctified in Christ. We are saints by calling. I don't care how you feel. It doesn't change the truth. It says here, verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which is given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in Him, in all speech, and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you at the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, through whom you are called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if that doesn't get you a little bit excited, I encourage you to read it again and make it your daily devotional reading every day this week. Because we often want to hear or buy into what the world has said about us or what the world accuses us of. Somebody needs to disprove the Bible in order for these first nine verses to not be true. And no one has done it in 1,700 years of its existence. So good luck trying. But if Paul's telling us the truth, it wasn't just true then, it's true now. And it is true of every single purse, person, purse, every single person, not based on anything that we've done. In fact, I would say by our behavior and decisions, we've invited God to condemn us. But isn't that what makes Romans 5.8 so great? God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, while we deserved punishment and chastisement and damnation, that's what we should have got. God demonstrates his love and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. I hope that's a sweet truth to you. I hope it makes your heart sing. Because I'll be honest with you, this world isn't doing very well in offering hope. It's not. 
So these are all the beautiful things that Paul knows are true. Not just about the dirty Corinthians, but also about the dirty saints at Grace Bible Church as well. And all that is beautiful about us is all that Jesus is in us. Praise God for that. Now he switches the gears. Verse 10. Now, I exhort you. And remember, that means beg, beseech, urge kind of idea. Look what he says here. Brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions, there be no rending, there be no tearing of the body of Christ into pieces among you, but that you be made complete, that you be mended in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each of you want, uh, sorry, that each of you, each one of you, is saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I think God that I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to what? Preach the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, not trying to be so intelligent that it gets your attention, not showing off his wit. Paul had the spiritual gift of knowledge, so it was automatically going to come out when he's walking in the Spirit. But that's never a means by hooking the fish. Now let's be honest. How many fishermen do we have in here? Have I ever told you guys about the time I went fishing by myself? Actually, I have my friend with me, but I had gone fishing all my life with my grandfather, and when he passed away, his tackle box was one of the things I got. And so me, knowing nothing, and literally nothing, right? I'm the person who said catching deer. Remember this. <laughs> Obviously, the biggest and the sparkliest bait is the one you want to use. That makes sense, right? No, None. I didn't have a clue what I was fishing for, what was in there. I just wanted to catch something. So I spent the time getting it all hooked up, ready to go. I had one of his rods, and I pulled back on it, and I released it and let it go, and it shot out there pretty far, and I was like, good grief. I don't know anything about casting a line, but that was amazing. You know, so it's 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet. And I realized the line had come out of the reel. <laughs> and it just went in and it hit. I saw boop like that. And you know how you can see just a little bit before it gets dark. It sunk. And I looked at my friend. I said, that's it. I pulled up the taco box and went. That was all. Spent the whole day planning to go out there. That's about the extent of my fishing. If you're fishing, you're going to be well-educated in using What's best going to be to the advantage? And why is that? Here's the reason why. Because you're the one doing all the work. Evangelism has very little to do with you doing the work. All it is is delivering a message. That's it. You're just a message bearer. The Holy Spirit does the work. In fact, the Holy Spirit's already doing the work, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's a big emphasis that we're going to look at today because if you notice, people who are unsaved get very uncomfortable around Christians when they want to bring up Jesus, the Bible, truth. And they retaliate against that because they're throwing up defense mechanisms trying to fight what's outside when what the real problem is is that the Holy Spirit's dealing with the inside. Paul understood that if he manipulated the message in any way, if he tried to go through to find out what kind of bait was going to work best with this kind of person, there was a consequence that was involved with that. And I think we need to pay very close attention to what it says. Not in cleverness of speech, 
Why? Notice that it uses so that, here's the reason, the cross of Christ would not be made, what is the word? Void. And it could be understood with two other meanings. Void is the one that they've chosen. Empty is another one. Emptiness. If you didn't have breakfast this morning, your belly is empty. It's void. But another interesting word that it's used sometimes as is veiled. Covered up. It can't be seen clearly. So let me state it for you plainly. When we manipulate the gospel of Christ based on the people that we're talking about, and either we get away from the cross, or we get away from sin, or we get away from the fact that they need a Savior, or we're trying to tout it in some way to hopefully tickle their ears and draw them in, you have robbed the opportunity of the Spirit's working and the offensiveness that is a bleeding and dying man who did nothing wrong, who is God in the flesh, who had to pay a price that you could never pay because we can't stop sinning, and then turning around and having an open hand that asks for nothing and offers that salvation freely. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. People don't like to hear it. You don't believe me? Think of an unsaved friend you have and introduce them to Jesus in that way. And they will rebel. They will mock you. They will ridicule. They will become antagonistic. They will throw up defense mechanisms. They will downplay it. They'll say, it's not for me. They'll say, I'm good with the Lord. Well, I believe there's a God. I had one person I said, do you know for sure? That you're going to heaven. Have you believed in Jesus? He said, I taught Sunday school for 13 years. That poor Sunday school class. Because if that is the reason why I am going, why I'm accepted by God, who did all the work? The person did. And God does not accept our work. No matter how good it is, no matter how many times you had to go back and do it again, God is not interested in our flesh. He's not. He's not. So Paul understands. If I get manipulative about the cross of Christ, I veil it. I render it void and empty. It can't do the work because I failed in dispensing the message. Now, Mary Cooper had some some conversation with me about this and she said don't you think that God still uses our imperfect gospel presentations maybe but if he does it's only by the grace of God and here's one thing that I know for sure I've been on fire for the Lord since October of 1998 okay I would say from probably the end December of 99 until this present day I have been constantly fighting this battle about lordship salvation and people trying to load down the gospel with things that you ought to do or a way you ought to be or a way you ought to look or things that you better give up in order for Jesus to accept you or how you ought to be after post-conversion in order to validate whether or not you're really truly authentically saved. And what I find is, is that people are looking for reasons in behavior, attitude, actions, words, all these types of things. And what they're not looking to is the finished work of Christ that qualifies one as saved. The question isn't, what have you done? The question is, is who do you believe? And so I've been fighting this for years and years and years. And I would say this, if we should be most highly concerned about anything, that this book would ever teach us, first and foremost, it had better be that we keep the gospel pure from any type of works whatsoever. Because as soon as we let somebody know, well, all you got to do is walk an aisle and go talk to the pastor. You ever wonder why we don't walk an aisle here? Because we don't give people the opportunity to go, how do you know that you're going to heaven when you die? Well, I walked the aisle. I remember the day. Well, I was baptized. I remember the day. Baptism doesn't save you. 
Well, I take communion. Communion doesn't save you. Well, I'm a member of the church. That doesn't save you. And how did you become a member of the church and not know Jesus Christ? What in the world? Yet these are all the merits that people would parade about why they're acceptable to God. The message needs to be clear. None of us are acceptable before God unless Jesus Christ is standing between him and me. That's it. And the only way that Jesus Christ is placed between a holy God who could snap my neck at a moment if he wanted to, but loves me so much that he gave a way out. The only way is by me believing what he's done. It's his finished work and me responding in faith to that. When that happens, Jesus stands in front and he clothes me with righteousness. And I am as righteous as Jesus himself in the sight of God because I have God's righteousness. Is it because I'm righteous? No, it's because Jesus was righteous for me. And he is my righteousness. That's the gospel. If people don't believe, a guaranteed existence in the lake of fire. If you want to reject Christ, make the most of this life that you possibly can, because when it's gone, it's gone. And you have nothing. Nothing. So Paul wants to be clear. Don't rob the gospel of its work. Don't mess it up. Don't cause divisions over it. Verse 18. For the word of the cross... The preaching of the cross of Christ is, what's the word? Foolishness to those who are perishing. Or let's say it this way. Jesus Christ is both life and light. In fact, we're told in John chapter 1, before the world was ever even created, the Trinity existed, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in perfect communion with one another, And they had something very interesting that was going on in between them. And it was the very thing that we call life, true life. Not physical life, eternal life. Eternal life existed forever with them. That's why it's called eternal. It always has been, and it always stretches and will be. Why is that? Because in and of themselves, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are life. What makes one acceptable to God? Whether or not they have life. Jesus gave his life that we might have his life by faith alone. But here's the thing. You tell somebody, do you realize that you are under the condemnation of God because you don't have life? Which if they don't have, if somebody doesn't have life, what are they? Dead. They're dead in sin. They're dead in trespasses. They're dead in the wrongness of their wrongfulness because they're so wrong. I don't know how else to stress that. But it's bad. It's bad. I get your attention? It's bad. And so when they hear about that someone had to save them, well, immediately that strips the pride, doesn't it? I have no claim in this. I I can't add to this. Everybody see why works regarding the gospel is so tempting? We want to get in there what we've done. We want to get in the little part that we played in order to turn the switch. And finally the lights came on. We're so bad that everything that we brought to God was everything that we needed to be saved from. If he filtered through all of it, he found none of it good. And so someone who doesn't know Christ and is hearing the gospel and they're dead, they're giving a dead response. That's foolishness. Now stop. Foolishness deals with the intellect, yes? 
Notice that it is someone using their mental faculties in order to sort through the factual information that you are providing to them, and they are coming to a logical and moral conclusion about what you've just said. I don't believe that's true. That sounds crazy. Opinions are stinky. In fact, let's think this through for a second. I usually like to pick on psychologists and psychiatrists about this, but I won't. Just think about this. If the totality of knowledge, okay, so we're talking 100%, and we all know one person that has the totality of knowledge, and that's God himself, yes? He's all-knowing, okay? So he knows everything inside and out. Again, this is the reason why when science stumbles across something and they say it's a discovery, it's because it's been there the whole time, they're just now coming upon it. And they still don't know everything about it once they unearth it, okay? But here's the interesting thing. If you take the totality of knowledge, here it is. And because you're dead in trespasses and sins, you automatically get rid of the spiritual component. Now, what do you have? At best, you have 50% of what's really going on. Does everybody see that? If life and existence is actually made up of the natural and the supernatural, and you take away The supernatural component, because you say, nah, this whole thing about sin and answering to a God, and he created everything, I'm an evolutionist scientist, blah, blah, blah. All you've got left is 50% at best, at your best. Are you complete in 50% of your knowledge? All you're dealing with is the flesh, the natural. Those things that you can taste, touch, smell, see. Here, everybody notice that those things are associated with the body? Interesting how we're created in order to process those things. But it only deals in one realm. And that realm is the flesh. Now, does anybody in here, if we've taken away the spiritual component and we've only got 50% of what we could possibly know about everything, does anybody in here do anything wrong? Okay. Jim doesn't, Paul does, everybody else is a liar. Okay, so we're all, here's where we're all at. We're all at less than 50% in some way. Now remember, we're talking about the totality of everything, okay? Spiritual components gone, so now we're at 50%. We've done some wrong things. How much wrong do you think we've done percentage-wise? 100% wrong. We only have 50% to work with. You need an abacus. That's okay. (laughs) Some of you don't know what an abacus is. See, if you don't know that, then you're automatically deficient in the fleshly knowledge. (laughs) So there we go. But let's say it the best. Let's give ourselves some credit here. Why? Because we got pride. And no one really knows the totality of what we know or don't know. We're the only ones that know that we don't know anything. But nobody else needs to know that. So let's just say we're going to puff it up. And when we puff it up, we're going to say we got maybe 30% knowledge. Now, we're already missing 70%. Okay? Let's say some bad things happen in our life. Let's say that we've been involved in a few things to where we've abused ourselves. In some situations, we've robbed ourselves of brain cells. Right? We have spent a lot of time in front of the TV. We just could not get enough YouTube. That kind of thing. Facebook robbed us of probably about 10%, so we're going to go down to 20%. Garbage in, garbage out, yes? I think it's interesting a computer company came up with that, not anybody else. But think about this. So let's say in the totality of knowledge, we're doing good between 20 and 30%. Do you think we have any business making any kind of claim about anything of eternal matters when we're only operating between 20 and 30% of what we could possibly know? No. And yet, the logical, which is a system of how we think, and the moral declaration we're going to make on a subject like this is, that's stupid. Where do we really stand with that we don't know Christ? Everybody see how insane that is? Everybody see that a claim like that is the hilt of foolishness. Now watch. The response, 
For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They're dying. In fact, if you want to write this down in your margin, I encourage you to because we're going to study it next week. This is called the natural man. And if you want to write chapter 2, verse 14, this is what Paul calls the natural man. It is someone that is devoid of life, making claims about existence and how they operate in the grand scheme of the world, and they have completely dismissed the gospel of Christ. It's unsaved people. But to us who are being saved, and if you want to write in next to us, this is the spiritual and carnal man. Spiritual and carnal. And if you want to put down the references for that, it's 215 through 34 of this same book. 215 through 34, the spiritual and the carnal man. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, this is a huge stretch between something that's been declared absolute foolishness, and yet you're turning around and going, no, no, no. This is the very power of supernatural deity and perfection. Now, what is the power? Go back and think. The what? Not, not just the cross. Yes, the cross, but, but, but the preaching of the cross. Do you realize that as a believer in Christ, you right now carry a message that when you dispense it to lost people and the conviction of the Holy Spirit finally brings them to a point where they're not willing to fight it anymore and they're not willing to self-medicate anymore and they're not willing to stand in denial and they're not willing to try to sit down and come up with all their clever arguments anymore, that it actually has the ability to bring someone from a domain of darkness into a place of absolute and perfect light. That's the power of the message of the cross. That's what Jesus came to do. All of their sin is gone. They were once dead and on the way to the lake of fire, a certain destiny, regardless if they believed it or not. And yet when they hear the gospel... Faith comes through hearing and hearing the word about Christ, Romans 10, 17. When they hear it and they believe, immediately a transfer is made. Immediately, things become different. Immediately, the Holy Spirit takes up residence. Immediately, the Spirit within a person is made righteous. Immediately, the person is declared righteous. Immediately, the person is set apart. Immediately, the person becomes a holy one. Immediately, all the riches and grace and access to God's great storeroom is made available to you because of the door of Jesus Christ. There is no other door. Why should we share the gospel with people? Because of the power that it has. Not because of the ability that I lack. Because of the power that it has. So a person who is unsaved is going to assess this information with the limited mental capacity that they have. And they're going to look at this and they're going to say, that's dumb. We're going to say, no, it's God's power. Now how does this unfold? Let's watch this. Verse 19, for it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Now, when this was originally written in Isaiah's time, Jerusalem had come to this point where when they worshiped God, they were going to go through the motions. This is just what we do, and this is my spiritual checklist, and if I just hop, skip, jump, God's pleased with that, and then we can move on about our day and serve our pagan deities and those types of things and live like idiots, and, and God's totally okay with it. God says, you think you're wise, but you're actually a fool in my eyes. The idea that if God is all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present, and the fact that we could get away with anything in his sight is the essence of foolishness. But because a person's dead, they can't see. They're blinded to this truth. Look how it moves forward, verse 20. Where's the wise man? 
Where is the scribe? And just so you know, a scribe was someone who was thoroughly acquainted with and taught the law. That's what they did as an occupation. And so they are running in and out of teaching religious practices in Judaism. It says here, where's the debater of this age, the philosophical smart guy? Where are they? And look what he says here. For, sorry, the debater of this age, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And how do we know that? Verse 21, for since the wisdom of God, sorry, for for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. So notice that. If the world is so smart, why can't they know God? You ever thought about that? If people want to profess to be brilliant, then why is it that they can't come to a knowledge of God in any way aside from the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you're so smart, why can't you get there? If you're so brilliant, why can't you make it happen? Does everybody see where Paul's getting at with this? You need Christ to get there which says that your wisdom is incomplete, your power is incomplete, your ability is incomplete, and your will is incomplete. Now that is a pride-dashing proposition because what it does is it exposes our utter neediness. I don't have it all together. I can't make it work. In fact, I thought about some of the most brilliant minds that this world has ever produced. I've got a couple of quotes About three quotes I want to share with you. Mitch, can we bring those up? The first one is by Carl Sagan. Is everybody familiar with Carl Sagan? Wrote the book Cosmos. The idea that God is an oversized white male with a flowing beard. Where does the scripture ever say that? Okay. (laughs) Got a lot of problems with a Jewish savior there. Who sits in the sky and tallies the fall of every sparrow is ludicrous. Stop. Is the second part of that sentence true? Does he know when every sparrow falls? He does. Why is it ludicrous? Because Carl Sagan said so? Ah, notice where the authority is. But if by God one means the set of physical laws that govern the universe, then clearly there is such a God. This God is emotionally unsatisfying. Notice he has to conclude that. There's nothing emotionally appealing about a God who just set up laws or or that the fact that God is the laws. It does not make much sense to pray to the law of gravity. Now, let me ask you a question. The fact that something like that exists, would it not presuppose that somebody put it there? When he died, he was considered probably the most brilliant man on the face of the earth. And yet, he missed it. He missed it. Here's the most tragic thing that I can think about. Who were the Christians in his life that failed to share the gospel with him? Everybody see that? If no one can come to know God in any other way except through Jesus Christ, then what it says is there is a responsibility to share the message so that that connection can be made complete. Why? Because this is the best that the most brilliant person on the face of the earth can do apart from the knowledge of the cross. And so what they do is they see how everything runs in symmetry. They see how everything has got a certain motion. They see how everything is held into existence. They understand the science behind if the earth was tipped one degree towards the sun, we'd all burn up. And one degree away from the sun, we would all freeze to death. They see all of these things and the evidence for the Christian is screaming to the idea that there is a God who is the creator of all things. And if he created us and we are his creatures, then we are automatically answerable to him for everything we do in life. And yet they look at this and they say, wow, we'll just pray to these laws. Seems kind of crazy. And if it's an emotionally unsatisfying, which he can conclude, what does that say about where he was personally as a person? See, situations like that don't lead to us condemning a person it leads to us feeling pity for them because they're probably extremely emotionally unsatisfied themselves what a sad existence you can't have authentic joy in that life now one of my favorite people on the face of the earth richard dawkins i am against religion stop i would love to have a conversation with him because i'd look at him and say i am too 
I'm against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Let me read it again. You're either, you're either all struck, dumb struck, or not struck, okay? I am against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Now, let me go ahead and tell you what this says apart from what it's saying. You can tell a lot by what somebody says or where they're coming from. It tells me that Richard Dawkins understands the Catholic Church thoroughly. That's what it tells me. Why? Because when you have a large institution that is highly prolific in England, where he's from, that wants to tout the idea that Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are nothing but a myth and a story to get the ball rolling, and then real life starts happening in chapter 12, and that if you don't do this, if you don't go here, if you don't pray this way, if you don't come do these things and take this, and all, that you, you can't go, you're anathema, you're damned. That is a religion. Because if you don't keep up the works, you're not going anywhere. Let me ask you a question. Does this book tell you about the world? In fact, this book tells us so much about the world, it's uncomfortable. That's why a lot of people don't want to deal with it. And if we nullify the idea that there is a creator, who do we have to answer to? We're all on equal playing field. There's no authority here. We're just all doing our own thing. I'm not in rebellion. I'm just acting out my natural processes as my synopsis fire away. The material universe, the materialistic universe is all that governs my thinking. And Richard Dawkins is actually a person who would argue to say, you can't take anybody to court for rape. Why not? Because they're just living out their life as they were naturally geared. It's just the material in their brain playing out its logical functions. Why? Because if he has to sit down on a moral side, he has to declare that there is a God who sets a standard of truth. See, that's what's interesting is, this is a comment of fear is what it is. If I come to terms with the biblical God, I'm in trouble. Religion's easy. You do this, you do that, you might make it. You know, that's like a game of Monopoly. But not Christianity. How about this one? The time that Stephen Hawking died, he was considered the greatest mind. If you believe in science like I do, you believe that there are certain laws that are always obeyed. If you like, you can say the laws are the work of God, but that is more a definition of God than a proof of his existence. What do we think about that quote? He nullified his own statement by what he said. Let me ask you a question. Why is it more of a definition of God than proof of his existence? For only one reason. Stephen Hawkins wanted you to think that way. It's because of the way that he stated it. Has nothing to do with the truth of the matter. Anybody think it's really interesting that when you look at the solar system, and we see models of this, right? In fact, some projects that kids have to come up with is to make a mobile of the solar system. Everybody know that? And they all have to have it in such a way as to where when it spins... It's got a circular motion. It stays a certain distance. Every one of them is in order. How come our planets aren't doing this? Wouldn't it only make sense that there's a God who set it in motion? You see what I'm saying? Our entire universe testifies to his existence. But if you're involved in this idea of saying, well, that's just foolishness then you will do everything you can to disqualify it because that is a response of desperation. I'm going to tell you guys a secret. Nobody set the clock on the back wall. So I don't have a clue what time it is. And I am not done. Now I want to show you something interesting. Yeah, it is. It is. I have an incomplete picture of where we are. That's going to cost you a finger. We're cutting it off as soon as we're done. That'll teach you. If you look in your handout, you've got a little slip of paper. It's incredibly nerdy, and that's okay. 
Nothing's going to hurt us from thinking a little deeply about what exactly has gone on here. This is what is known as a chiasm. A chiasm is a literary device that the Holy Spirit inspires authors of Scripture to use when they want to hammer home a point as you would be reading through a situation. So I want to read through this with you, and I want to talk with you about it for just a moment. I'm not here to burden you with it, but I want you to see why people employ and why the Holy Spirit employs this literary device in order to get the point across, okay? So here we go. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign, and Greeks, that's Gentiles, pagans, search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a stumbling block, to Gentiles, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let me show you how to mark this up real quick. Notice in our A portion at the top, the subject under consideration regards the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is, is butting its head against the wisdom of this world because the wisdom of this world is insufficient to make it to God when it denies Christ, okay? So in your A section here of the wisdom of God, I want you to go down to the A apostrophe section and notice it says because the foolishness of God, and if you skip over a little bit more, and the weakness of of God. Does everybody see that those are opposites of what you're dealing with in the A section? And the reason is, is because Paul's being a little tongue in cheek here. He's really, um, he had the spiritual gift of sarcasm and he's really pushing over a point here, okay? Notice it says in the B section, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Go down to the B apostrophe section. But to those who are called, Those are the ones who believe. What I did is I put just a little asterisk next to that. Those who are called, and I put a little asterisk next to those who believe. If you believe, you are the called. If you're called, you believe. That's the way it goes together. One and the same. There's not a difference there. But now look at the next part here. Everybody see up in the B section, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. Does everybody see the message preached? The message preached is parallel in your B apostrophe section with the power of God and the wisdom of God. Why is that? Because the message preached is what's being declared by the natural man, the lost man, to be foolishness. And this is the actual essence of what is the wisdom and power of God. Now, does everybody see Christ's name there under the B apostrophe section? I want you to get this point and not miss it. Christ the power of God, the wisdom of God. Notice it's not that God is wise. That's true, but that's not what he's trying to hammer home. Notice it's not that God is powerful. That's true, but it's not what he's trying to hammer home. What he's saying is, is that when you study the person of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, you actually find that Christ is the wisdom of God. That in the cross, Christ is the power of God. Why is that? Because God saw a situation where unregenerate, lost, and dead human beings are not able to make it to him in any way. And so he overcomes their ignorance and supplies an entry so that people can know him. He overcame the sin problem in an incredibly intelligent way. By offering Christ in the likeness of sinful flesh like we are, yet born of a virgin, therefore not inheriting the sin nature within himself, but yet becoming an acceptable an acceptable vehicle in order to lay down willingly on the cross altar and therefore shed his blood to pay the price of everything that we've ever run up in life. Does everybody see that? Those are incredible economics. If you just viewed that from a monetary standpoint, you say, good grief, how in the world did God come together with this? 
Because the more you think about what God did in the cross through Jesus Christ, it blows your mind. I don't know about you, but I could stand to have my mind blown daily by the cross of Jesus Christ. Because what he's done there in overcoming my willing rebellion against him, it's brilliant. Not only that, but it holds power. Why is that? Because everything I was cultivating was one direction. Led straight to the lake of fire. That's the best I could do. The best I can do is operate in such a way that further speeds up my decline into hell and torment. That's it. That's the best I can do. Anybody ever gotten on a sled and you pushed off a little bit and you're like, why ain't this going? You get a little frustrated and then you hit that sweep spot and you're gone. No, but just me? This only happens? Okay, good grief. We're like, what's wrong? You guys don't go sledding? Maybe we just appreciate the snow because we never had it in southern Indiana, okay? But here's the thing. I got it on the top of our driveway. I said, babe, look for cars. She's like, you're good. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) you know? And I sat down on that thing, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you it wasn't my weight, okay? It was the snow. (laughs) But I push off, and I'm like, it, it, it. And I'm like, this is terrible. And Nathaniel's like, come on, daddy. And I'm like, what's this guy doing? So finally, I got up and grabbed a hold of it, and I just ran a few steps, and I belly flopped on top of it. Snow all in my face. I went about two feet. It was terrible. (laughs) But when you're born into this world, and you're automatically positioned on a decline because we're depraved, and we're sinful, and we're selfish, and we're prideful, all the ability that I have is just to hurry myself along to meet that downward destination. The power of God flips my sled and grabs a hold of my broken body and he draws me to himself. And when Satan comes against me as an accuser, he says, not my child. My child's covered. Jesus Christ has covered my child. Christ is the power of God. Let's finish up this chiasm here. Notice your C sections. For indeed, Jews, and notice I underlined them for you so you could see them, Jews and Greeks, Jews want signs. That's the evidence. I've got to see it. Everybody remember when Jesus cleansed the temple in John chapter 2? And they came to him. He's flipping tables and don't make my father's house a place of den, den of robbers and thieves. It's a place of worship. Or... In my translation, what's wrong with y'all? Right? Jesus was angry. And then the Pharisees came to him and they said, by what signs are you doing this? We want to see a sign. I know when we sit here and we look at the text and be like, what is wrong with these people? Right? We got to see a sign. Show us a sign. Now this wasn't any different for Thomas, right? I mean, he was actually kind of, dare I say it, boisterous about it. Unless I put my hand in his side and I put my finger in the nail holes of his hand, I will not believe because I got to have a sign. Jews want a sign. That's their evidence. Greeks, Gentiles, pagans want their brains tickled. You ever wondered why the the, uh, American Christianity is so bent on apologetics? The reason is, it's not that apologetics are bad, giving reasons and defenses for why we believe what we believe. That's the place where we're meeting people in the marketplace of ideas. We need convincing. Somebody needs to show us the evidence of God and his existence. And so therefore, I need my brain tickled in order to make this palatable for me to accept kind of idea. Now look at your C apostrophe section. Notice, to the Jews, Christ crucified is a stumbling block. Jesus Christ dying on the cross and paying for the sin penalty of every single person, I don't know about you, but that's a sign. Would you agree that's a sign? See, it's interesting. It's a sign, it's just not the type of sign that a Jew would want. Show me something else. Show me something better. Show me something different. Okay, let's resurrect him after three days. Will that convince you? No, no, uh, his apostles took the body. Here, take some money. Don't say anything. That's how they dealt with that situation. But notice the next part. 
To Gentiles, it's foolishness. Ah, that's dumb. It's not worth my time. That's not real. That's not true, says who? The person with between 20 and 30% of knowledge that only exists in the fleshly realm? Is that the person we're trusting with this amazing critique of what's right and what's wrong? It's insane. Now, here's the reason why a chiasm exists the way that it does, because it has parallel accounts, either saying the same thing in a different way or opposites that are playing off of one another, showing cause and effect, showing answers and questions, showing results of things desired like we see in the C-sections. But look at D. It all culminates in this one line in D. And whenever they do this, setting up this structure, this literary structure, they want you to get this one big idea. And I want you to leave with nothing else but this one big idea. But we preach Christ crucified. Why is that? Because that's the answer. When a Jew wants a sign, and when a Greek wants wisdom, our answer is Christ. Not argument. Not argument. Our answer is the fact that Jesus Christ had to come and die for you. That's the problem. You want to know a secret? Jews want a sign, but that's not what they need. And that's not the deep problem. How do we know that? Didn't Jesus do a ton of signs? In fact, didn't John say at the end of his book, if I wrote down all the signs that Jesus did, there's not enough books in the world to contain it. How much was enough? It was never enough. Here's the reason why. Because it was never about the signs. When Paul is debating with the Gentiles in Athens at the Areopagus, and he's going back and forth with them about, you have this altar set up to an unknown God. You have this propensity to worship. You don't even know what you're worshiping here. Let me tell you about God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. Let me set him down in front of you so that you can understand about him. Some believed, some didn't. If it was really about a quest for satisfying knowledge, why didn't they believe? Why didn't all of them believe? How come they didn't jump on this and say, yes, this is the answer we've been looking for? We wanted more wisdom, and you've given us this answer. Here's the reason why. Because the human heart doesn't want the answer that Jesus provides. The issue isn't signs and it's not wisdom. It's a heart issue. And the problem is unbelief. Jesus Christ had to die. He had to. Apart from him, there's no hope. There's no other way. Oh, that's so narrow-minded. It's not narrow-minded. God wasn't obligated to save a single person. And he put forward a Savior who made the savability of every person possible. Why is that? How many sins did Jesus die for on the cross? All of them. Which, catch this, guys. I've said this three and four times. Well, probably more than that. I say a lot. But anyway. Think through this real quick. If Jesus Christ died for every person's sins and he paid the price completely, we would all agree that Jesus is a sufficient Savior, yes? Then notice, what's keeping people from believing Jesus is no longer their sin problem. Why is that? Debt's been paid. The debt is done. Any of that against a person that would render them not able to be saved because their sin has disqualified them from salvation, has been removed as a wall that kept them from the Almighty. So because their debt has been paid, Jesus reaches forward and say, whoever believes, whoever believes, or we'll say it in the King James, whosoever will, right? We know John 3.16, God loves the world. God gave his son. Whoever believes in him will not perish. The downward slope where we were on our way. We'll have everlasting life. There's a gospel. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Stop and ask yourself a question. Why? Because it's not true. Who in the world made you the decider of what's true and not? That is not a sober evaluation of oneself. That is a sense of entitlement and pride. And trust me, our current generation has a ton of problem with that. It's foolishness. Okay, so you're agreeing with what the Scripture says. That your position in life is the fact that it's foolishness. I tell you what, to us being saved, 
to us who know Jesus Christ. It is the power of God. And let me tell you this. Let me stress it very clearly because Paul makes it clear. If he manipulates the gospel, it's veiled, it's empty, it's void. And so what is the conclusion he comes to in the chiasm? But we preach Christ crucified. When people want signs and when people want wisdom, you still give them the same answer. It was never the church's job or responsibility to give the world what they wanted. It was always, from its very calling in Acts chapter 2, the church's responsibility to give people what they needed. The world's got enough of what they want from the church, so much so that the world has invaded the church. The world has no place in the church. I know that sounds harsh. Does that mean I can't bring lost people? Yes, bring lost people. They need to hear the gospel. But they also need to hear you tell them. Regardless of what the issue is, the answer is always the same. Christ and Him crucified. That's what they have to deal with. That's what they have to deal with. God had to die to save them because they could not save themselves. Pray together. Father, I know that the enemy wants to put everything in front of our minds in our social social situations to keep us from the message of Christ and Him crucified. That is the main thing. That is the first point. That is the answer above all else. Father, make us mindful where we want to manipulate the gospel. Give us grace and compassion upon people who rebel against the gospel. Can't blame them for how they feel. We were all there at one time. But Father, I pray that we rest in Christ, who is the answer, who is the power of God, who is the wisdom of God. That He always be our answer. That He be the only answer that we offer. And just let the Holy Spirit do His convicting work. Father, thank You that we have a Savior worth believing, a message worth telling, a life worth living that we actually have hope that you actually give us rest. And I pray, God, that our hearts are impressed. However, the Holy Spirit needs to minister it to us. These truths, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.